In the previous video, we keyed out three fish species using the Miller and Lee Guide to Coastal Marine Fishes of California. In this video, I'll piece together a virtual dissection using material that I have on hand, as well as some images posted by students from previous semesters. I'll focus largely on the vermilion rockfish because of the actual fishes that I have on hand to make this video, it's in the best shape. And by the way, many thanks to my Miracosta colleague Janine Sepulveda for providing me with the fishes used in the video footage to be included here. We'll start by looking at the anatomy of the head, specifically the mouth and gills, as they relate to the fish's eating and breathing. How does the fish eat? without swallowing a ton of water with every meal. For most fishes, they capture their prey by sucking in a large volume of water, including their prey. They can do this because their mouths and head anatomy are oddly dynamic, such that by using specialized facial musculature, they can create such negative pressure in their mouth cavity that by opening their mouth suddenly, they basically slurp up anything that's in the water in front of them. Once the prey is inside their mouth, they make the walls of the mouth cavity squeeze in on whatever it is that they just engulfed, pressing the water out through the gill openings. The food items don't get expelled with the water because there are hard gill rakers that create a colander-like basket trapping the food inside the mouth so the fish can swallow it without a ton of water. We'll pay special attention to the gill rakers in our fish because they can tell us what kind of food the fish habitually eats. The path of water as the fish breathes is basically the same, in through the mouth and out through the gill openings. But make no mistake, feeding and breathing are two fundamentally different activities. In the case of breathing, the fish relies on a steady flow of water from the mouth cavity to the outside through the gill openings. This is different than during eating, when a gigantic flush of water gets expelled across the gills when the fish is squeezing out the food before swallowing. Water from the mouth cavity flows through the spaces between the fish's five gill arches, and red gill filaments carrying the fish's blood allow for gas exchange, uptake of O2 into the blood from the water, and removal of CO2 from the blood into the water. Now we're going to cut away an operculum exposing the mouth cavity, or buccal cavity, so you can see what I'm talking about. As you do this, you can assess the freshness of your fish by looking at the color of the gill filaments. Bright red means the fish is very fresh. The blood that you're seeing through the thin walls of the gill filaments is still in very good shape. As the blood starts to break down as a result of proteases that remain active after the fish dies, the hemoglobin starts to discolor and the gills go from bright red to purplish brown. This is a good thing to know about when you're in the seafood market selecting a whole fish to buy for dinner. Even though the fishes I take into class have been dead for about the same amount of time and under refrigeration for most of that time, the mackerel and the sardine will usually have undergone a greater degree of breakdown compared with the rockfish. You may be familiar with the idea that there are some fishes that are fishier than others, meaning that they have a stronger smell and flavor. Usually, it's fishes with higher baseline metabolic rates that have greater amounts of proteases in their tissues, causing decay to occur faster. That is, liberating more of the compounds that make fish get smellier the longer it sits in your fridge. Mackerel and sardines are both far more active compared to the rockfish. Mackerel are obligated to swim forward at all times in order to ventilate their gills. A characteristic of the family Scombridae is a lack of the ability to pump enough water to breathe unless they're swimming forward using this forward motion to create enough positive pressure in the mouth cavity to allow for that continual flow of water across the gills. This is called ram ventilation, like the water is being rammed into the fish's mouth cavity as the fish swims forward with its mouth slightly open. Sardines are not in the scombridae, but they also swim forward continuously as open water filter feeders. Rockfish, on the other hand, are sit and wait predators, swimming actively only for short bursts to attack a prey or to escape predators. 
you'll notice that there are four free gill arches plus a little one that's attached to the operculum. The sixth arch of bony fish gets modified during embryonic development and serves to supply blood to the swim bladder of the adult fish. The four free gill arches attach at the bottom to the ventral aorta and at the top to the left and right dorsal aorta. Each arch receives blood from the ventral aorta, which has been pressurized by the heart. This blood coming from the heart is, for the most part, oxygen depleted, having been returned to the heart from all parts of the fish. On the way up through the gill arches, the blood makes exactly one trip out onto a gill filament and then returns to the gill arch fully oxygenated and then proceeds to its dorsal aorta directly. This requires a pretty sophisticated architecture, and this is what we'll be talking about for the next few minutes. But before we get to the issues of gas exchange, let's finish up on the feeding question. We're going to cut out the four gill arches, keeping them in order from the second arch, which is the one closest to the operculum, to the fifth arch. Snip them out one at a time and lay them out onto a paper towel. And yes, they will contain blood. The first thing to note is that the gill rakers are not red in color. These are largely inert rods of cartilage, and they sit on the inside of the gill arch's curve. Compare the gill rakers of the bulk feeding rockfish with those of the filter feeding sardine. Sardine gill rakers are long, fine, and hair like, while those of the rockfish are stout little nubs, maybe a little longer on the front gill arch but nothing like those seen in the sardine. Looking at the sardine's superfine gill rakers, you can infer that they're able to trap tiny things like zooplankton. And as it turns out, such tiny things, in fact, form most of the sardine diet. Things as small as that could never be trapped by the gill rakers in the rockfish. They'd just be expelled with the water. Unlike the sardine, the rockfish is a bulk feeder it consumes food items that are at least big enough to be trapped by its gill raker basket. Even bulk feeders have variation in their gill rakers. Those eating larger bulk items will have larger, harder rods of cartilage that can prevent the escape of more active living prey. Remember that anything making its way past the gill rakers could cause damage to the more delicate gill filaments on the other side of the gill arches. The mackerel's gill rakers are sort of in between the morphologies of the sardine and the rockfish, longer and finer than the rockfish, but not so much as the sardine. What does this suggest about the mackerel's diet? Okay, so this drawing represents a single gill arch on the left side of the fish, like the view that we have on the vermilion rockfish. Blood is coming into the gill arch from the ventral aorta, and it ends up fully oxidated in the left dorsal aorta at the top of the arch. Now on the inside curve of the gill arch are the gill rakers. They don't have anything to do with circulation. I'm just including them in the diagram here because they're in the gill arches that we've just dissected out. The gill filaments are on the outside curvature of the gill arch, and at least on our dead fish, they point away from the mouth cavity. Oxygen-poor blood is pumped upward through the gill arch. Remember, it's just been pressurized by the heart. I'm following a standard convention here in showing the O2-depleted blood in blue, and later I'll show the O2-rich blood as red. All of the blood coming up from the ventral aorta will make exactly one trip out onto one of the many gill filaments, and then will return to the gill arch fully loaded with O2 to be delivered to some other part of the fish's anatomy. After returning to the gill arch from any of the many filaments, the blood proceeds directly up to the dorsal aorta, fully loaded with oxygen and fully discharged of carbon dioxide. Now we're going to take a closer look at the gill filaments themselves. They look like they extend straight back, away from the mouth cavity, but this is just how they appear in a dead fish. When the fish is alive and breathing, and actually moving water across the gill arches. Those gill filaments, and yes, 
there are actually two filaments there that can be separated. Go ahead and confirm this if you're looking at an actual fish gill right now. Those gill filaments are held out at an oblique angle to the flow of water that's coming across the gill arch from the mouth cavity. We'll see the significance of this shortly. Okay, so there are actually two blood vessels in the gill arch. One carries O2 poor blood from the heart. This blood is taken out onto a gill filament in a vessel that runs along its back or inside edge. This is the side that's further from the mouth cavity when the gill filaments are flared out like this. Then the blood flows through lamellae. Essentially, these are the capillaries where the blood comes very close to the gill surface and is closest to the water moving across the gill filament. It's on this very short trip from the back edge of the gill filament to the front edge where most of the oxygen uptake occurs. Then, the oxygen-rich blood moves back to the gill arch along the front edge of the filament and it returns to the second blood vessel in the gill arch. This is the one that carries the oxygen-rich blood to the dorsal aorta. This plumbing arrangement is ideal because it results in blood taking only a single trip out onto a gill filament. One trip onto a filament is enough to fully oxygenate the blood. It would be inefficient for blood going up the gill arch to make multiple trips. With this vascular architecture, the fish is able to move a large volume of blood through its gills. Remember that there are hundreds of filaments on each arch and five arches on each side of the fish. This vasculature allows the fish to pick up O2 with great efficiency. And now, if we look more closely at the blood right there at the gill lamellae, essentially the gill's gas exchange capillary, where O2 depleted blood from the heart gains a full charge of oxygen by the time it reaches the opposite edge of the gill filament, we notice, and this is very significant, that the water providing the oxygen flows in the opposite direction relative to the blood that's picking up the oxygen. This counter current flow is something that we'll see repeatedly in several different contexts in our discussions of animal physiology. The fish's gills is one of the classic examples known well to all biologists and it's an essential bit of learning. Basically Having the two non-mingling media, here blood and water, flowing in opposite directions allows for the most effective exchange of gases. In this case, I'm showing O2 moving into the blood from the water, but we could also be talking about CO2 being discharged into the water from the blood. This counter-current exchange is going to be a recurrent motif in our physiology-focused discussions and lecture. And this is just a great opportunity for me to introduce the concept. Before moving forward, let's recap the structures that we've highlighted so far in this video. There's the mouth cavity and operculum. Five gill arches connecting the ventral aorta with left and right dorsal aorta. Each gill arch has two main blood vessels, one carrying O2 poor blood from the heart and the other carrying O2 loaded blood to the dorsal aorta. Gill rakers and gill filaments. And the lamellae, that is, gill capillaries where the gas exchange with the ventilating water takes place. And in addition, I tried to clarify the respective flows of water and blood through this gill architecture, with a specific focus on the counter-current exchange of gases as it occurs between the blood and the water at the gill lamellae. Next, we'll be looking at the fish's two-chambered heart, which is usually in the ventral part of the body cavity, but way forward, below and actually in front of the pectoral fin in the area called the isthmus. This is actually just behind where the ventral aorta is pushing blood into the gill arches. To expose the heart, you need to cut through the body wall in this area. And like with the squid last week, a sturdy pair of scissors does a good job of doing this without cutting up the stuff inside of the body cavity with the tip of your blade, as you might do if you were using a scalpel. A word of warning though. You'll need to be cutting through a rather thick layer of both bone and muscle. And so, if your fish is on the larger side, you'll need some pretty hefty scissors. 
Here we're looking at the vermilion rockfish, but I also have a mackerel to cut, as well as a few images from past students' dissections. It's possible to expose the interior of the body cavity without disrupting the pericardium, the thin membrane surrounding the heart. And if this happens in your dissection, that's actually a really good sign that you're being careful with your cutting. But you still need to open the pericardium because we need to see the heart. You should be able to locate the two most easily identifiable structures of the heart simply based on their appearance. The ventricle and the bulbous arteriosus are very easy to spot. The ventricle is dark and usually has a recognizable pyramid-like shape. It's usually pretty firm, not gushy at all, because it's a thick-walled, pretty beefy mass of muscle. The pump that pressurizes the blood so it can flow through those gill arches we talked about just before. The bulbous arteriosus is usually white or pale in color and has a wide end attaching to the ventricle and tapers anteriorly, transitioning into the ventral aorta. The bulbus is also very firm in texture because it's made of thick elastic connective tissue. It needs to expand to accommodate the peak flow of blood out of the ventricle, and because it's elastic, it exerts continuous pressure on the blood, pushing it into the ventral aorta even during the period when the ventricle is relaxing and filling with blood in preparation for the next contraction or heartbeat. Now, in your own cardiovascular system, you have something really similar to modulate the pressure variation coming out of your left ventricle. And it is... Any guesses? Well, it's the entirety of your arteries, which differ structurally from your veins in having thick elastic walls. But in particular, your dorsal aorta has great elasticity. The property is actually called compliance. And in some people, the aorta becomes less stretchy with age. With lower elasticity, the aorta is less able to modulate blood pressure within a narrow range, and consequently, there's a bigger difference between systolic and diastolic pressures. You can locate the atrium of your fish's heart attached to the ventricle but on top. You often don't see it looking at the opened up fish from the bottom, but if you widen the body cavity and nudge the ventricle out of the way a bit with your fingers, you get more of a side view. You can see that the firm pyramidal ventricle attaches to another much gushier structure that sits right above it. This is the atrium. We're switching species here and looking at the mackerel. It was kind of hard to get a good picture of the atrium of the rockfish. The mackerel's heart is larger and this is an advantage here. The atrium is a legitimate part of the heart because it is a muscular pump. But unlike the ventricle, it needs only to pump the blood a short distance to the ventricle, which it's right next to. No thick walls are necessary. The ventricle and the bulbous arteriosus are identifiable by their appearance and firmness. There's nothing similar in the rest of the fish. On the other hand, there are a few other somewhat smushy brown structures that could be mistaken for the atrium you'll need to use the location of the atrium, that is, its connection to the ventricle, in order to identify it. The atrium, in turn, fills passively from the sinus venosus, a blood-filled sac that receives venous blood from all over the fish's circulation. Usually, the dissection to this point is relatively blood-free, apart from a few drops when you remove the gills, but all that changes when you cut into the sinus venosus. Blood from all parts of the fish returns via the veins to the sinus, which feeds the atrium passively. It doesn't have any muscular walls allowing it to contract, and thus it doesn't qualify as a heart chamber. As we just said, blood from the sinus venosus fills the atrium passively, and then the atrium pumps the blood to the ventricle, and this is really just a bit of assistance to help the ventricle fill with blood during its relaxation or refractory period. The ventricle pumps blood into the bulbous arteriosus that expands at peak pressure 
and its elasticity provides continual pressure at the ventral aorta, which pushes blood up through the gill arches where gas exchange occurs. When the blood gets through the gill arches and into the dorsal aorta, it moves based on residual pressure to the rest of the body, and it returns back to the sinus venosus to start the circulation all over again. Now, taking a look at the sizes of the hearts of the two fish seen here. I know it's not especially obvious in these images, but the mackerel has a heart that's much larger in proportion with the overall size of the body compared with the vermilion rockfish. Now explain this to me. Why would the mackerel have such an oversized heart in comparison with a rockfish? Here's a different fish altogether. It's a lot fresher, and the colors on its innards are much closer to what the actual organs on a living fish would be like. Can you identify the structures? Here are the answers. Now tell me this. Which direction is the fish pointing? To the right or to the left? One more question. Does this fish look to you like a fish that is an active, continual swimmer like the mackerel, or largely a sedentary sit-and-wait predator like the rockfish? Next, we can tackle the digestive anatomy. The mouth cavity should still be where we left it. And from the mouth, the food passes through the esophagus and into the stomach, specifically the cardiac stomach, which is expandable. It's an expandable compartment that can accommodate a really large food item. Here I've stuck the scissors into the cardiac stomach of the rockfish. Uh, it's sticking in from the esophagus, and you can see some of the elasticity. And here it is for the mackerel. Uh, predatory fish like these are often able to ingest prey items that aren't much smaller than they are, and ingest them whole. If you can visualize yourself swallowing a six-year-old human, that's basically the picture your stomach would need to have very stretchy walls to accommodate such a large meal. Now, after some chemical and mechanical digestion in the cardiac stomach, the food passes into a pyloric stomach, which is really functionally more like the intestine in the sense that a lot of absorption of nutrients is taking place here. And then whatever remains travels through the rest of the intestine and gets pooped out through the fish's anus. The pyloric stomach is often covered by little things that kind of look like worms. These are actually pyloric cecum. Cecum is a Latin word for blind sac. Cecum is plural. Here, there are tubes that open into the main lumen of the pyloric stomach. In the fish, these cecum provide surface area for the absorption of nutrients. Attaching to the GI near the pyloric stomach are the liver, the pancreas and gallbladder, and the spleen. It's also in this general area. The liver is generally pretty easy to recognize because, well, it looks like a liver. The gallbladder is green, and the spleen is dark and somewhat long and a bit smushy. It's in the same general area. And the pancreas, I'm told, is there as well, although I couldn't tell you what it actually looks like in a fish. Another thing you're almost certain to find in the viscery of any locally caught fresh fish is live parasites. If you see any yellow or transparent slimy spots on the gill filaments, those are parasites, probably flatworms or crustaceans. If you find any squirmy, still alive, beige to transparent worms in either the gut cavity or the muscle of your fish, it's more than likely a nematode, and the most common one we see is anisacus. This particular worm is of some concern to lovers of raw fish, like sashimi or fish carpaccio or ceviche, all three things that I like a lot. And anisacus is a real concern because of the way that these worms will find the human gut to be an okay place to continue on with their infectious cycle. We can be an acceptable surrogate for anisacus's normal definitive host species, which includes various kinds of pinniped. Locally, we have the California sea lions and harbor seals in great abundance. Go to the children's beach in La Jolla if you don't believe me. 
The narrative here starts with a seal that has a raging party of worms in its gut, and it poops out huge numbers of cysts, which get eaten by fish, and there they develop into the worms. Now when the fish gets eaten by another seal, the worms in the fish will have found a new home where they can reproduce sexually with the other worms and continue the cycle. Seals and sea lions may be the intended hosts, but human anatomy is evidently close enough as far as a worm is concerned. So if someone were unfortunate enough to eat a worm along with a slab of raw fish topping their sushi, they could become the host for the next raging worm party. Bring this up when this coronavirus thing blows over and you and your friends are able to go out for a sushi dinner. Depending on the season and the fish species that I'm able to collect, the fish species we have in the lab for the dissection may or may not have well-developed gonads. If you find two long sacks that look kind of grainy with a translucent orangish color, those are ovaries. If there's a pair of opaque white things like this, usually pretty firm, those are testes. If you have gonads in your fish, they usually aren't attached to anything in front, except maybe for some blood vessels. But if you trace them to the back, they connect with a urogenital opening of the fish near its anus. Depending on the fish you're dissecting, you may or may not see a swim bladder. If it's there, the swim bladder will be near the top, the dorsal side of the body cavity, right up against the backbone. In some species, they're kind of thick-walled and white, while in other species, it looks just like a transparent membrane with air inside. Sharks and rays never have swim bladders. They never evolved them. All bony fishes either have swim bladders or lost them, or, as in the case with us, converted them into lungs. Those fishes that lost their swim bladders are usually ones that live full-time on the bottom. Flatfishes and scorpion fishes are examples, but some of the obligate full-time REM ventilators like tunas and bonitas also lack them. They don't sink because they're always swimming. If you remove the swim bladder by pulling it out, you'll see a line of dark colored bloody tissue that runs just below the vertebral column in the body cavity. It's actually pressed between the swim bladder and the vertebrae, and these are the kidneys. You'll note that they don't have that characteristic kidney bean shape. This is just what fish kidneys look like. They're mesonephric kidneys. Now in mammals, we go through a stage in embryonic development in which we actually have the same type of mesonephric kidneys, but they only function until our regular bean-shaped metanephric kidneys mature. Once we have our final kidneys, these mesonephric structures get repurposed, mostly into the different parts of the reproductive tract, both in males and females. We're in the home stretch now, and usually by this time of the lab, we're pushing up against the clock, and I can just point out a few things about the fish's body musculature. In particular, I like to focus on two things, body segmentation and the distinction between dark and light muscle. Most students find it easy to identify an earthworm or a centipede as having body segmentation. Insects are also easy enough to picture as having a body structure that's derived from a centipede-like ancestor. And even as adults, you can see obvious segmentation or metamerization in parts of the body, like the abdomen of a cockroach. But what about humans? Are we similarly segmented? Most students will say no at least not any part of our anatomy, except for the vertebrae, which are pretty obviously metameric in structure. And for a few low body fat gym rat types, you can notice the abdominal muscles is being repeated. Vertebrates, one might conclude, are not generally segmented, at least not from the exterior. That being said, in the early stages of development, like just when the mesoderm forms, the first thing that happens in the embryo, even us, is that the mesoderm self-organizes itself into multiple salami slices. Each slice is called a somite. 
and it's the basic unit of mesodermal body structure. Each somite differentiates into a vertebra in the middle and a myomere, a slab of future muscle, on the outside. The axial part of our skeletal musculature all derives from these myomeres, and it's only the abs in your sculpted eight-pack that shows any of the repetition that you once had as an embryo. Fish, however, retain most of their axial musculature as essentially a sideways stack of myotomes, and you could see this if you remove the skin. Remember keying out this fish? It's a long, thin sand dab in the bothity, part of the flatfishes that you get to very early in the Miller and Lee dichotomous key. What you need to note here are the myotomes, separated by myosepta. The other thing we'll note about the musculature in our fish is how there's a clear distinction between dark and light muscle. The darker colored muscle, you can call it aerobic muscle or red muscle or slow twitch muscle, is more richly endowed with the respiratory pigment myoglobin, allowing it to extract oxygen from the blood better than the lighter white or fast twitch muscle. When you see dark muscle, I want you to visualize that this is muscle that can be used continually for sustained activity. And being more highly metabolically active, it will contain more of the enzymes causing a more rapid breakdown after death. And so a lot of fish consumers prefer to trim away this part from a fillet and give it to the cat. Moreover, a fish that swims continuously as a matter of its ecology, for instance, the mackerel and the sardine are continuously swimming, they will have a greater amount of dark muscle compared with the rockfish, which, as a sit-and-wait predator, doesn't make use of sustained swimming. You can see a striking difference between the fishes in the amount of red muscle that you see in the cross-section. The last thing we do is cut the fish in cross-section so that we can assess the relative amounts of red muscle in our various fish species. Here I'm giving only you the mackerel and the rockfish to compare. And there actually is a little bit of dark muscle in the rockfish around the outside. Are these results surprising? Okay, now that pretty much ends our virtual fish dissection in the coronavirus semester. Here's a little challenge for you, though. In this image posted by a very industrious student from a past semester, the various parts of the fish anatomy are labeled and I'll reveal the identities of the fish parts. And no, I'm not going to guarantee that they're correct. But I'll do so after scanning about. And I'm going to put a stop into the playback, so if you want to rewind and have another look, you can. And you can do this as many times as you like. But after the stop, the big reveal will occur. Enjoy. <laughs>